Welcome everyone to a brand new Grand Tactician The Civil War campaign. I've already announced this to our patrons, but now everyone's in on it. And we're going to do a union campaign, but we're going to do a couple of things that I have not done before to make it more challenging, to make it more interesting. And what that means is that I will not be issuing any orders at the brigade level. Now you'll see what that means once we get into an actual battle, but what it means is I will be relying on my division commanders to make the decisions. I will give division orders, I will give stance uh, orders uh, to the AI, but then otherwise the AI division commanders are gonna be responsible for placing their own brigades, for the defense, for the assault, for all that stuff. And I'm gonna get really, really frustrated by how they choose to do that, but that's the way this is gonna go. Should be interesting. Let's go ahead and dive in. So we're gonna start the campaign in spring of 1861. I will be doing the Union side. We're gonna give the max AI bonus and the highest difficulty, which is very hard. The AI bonus means we're going to have to conquer a lot of the South in order to be able to win because his national morale is going to be much, much higher than it otherwise would be. Uh, and we're going to go ahead and just keep the historic uh, policies uh, for uh, what we do. We're going to do um, random for the AI. Although no, that's the AI opponent's policies. Okay, well we're gonna we're gonna keep them, make them random. We don't know what he's gonna do. Uh, for us, we get to choose our own. Uh, so I'm gonna go with. Um, let's take a look here. Kansas, a free state. I'm not really worried about Kansas too much. Um, railroad transport capacity and construction speed might be nice. Indian Wars. Uh, military experience in Union and CSA is plus five, and Union morale plus five. That might be good. Security measures. CS uh, will start the game with 50% less available ships and weapons. We're not going to do that. Breadbasket. That gives me a bonus to relations with Europe. Um, support abolitionism. Southern supports in all states within the Union. Yeah, I like that idea. Ah, you know what? We'll just go with those three. Let's do it. All right, here we go. We'll go ahead and skip that for now. Uh, so this is our first time doing a Union campaign since the full release of the game. So it's going to be a very different experience than previous. Especially now with the readiness feature, which is a, a really, really important one, I think. Especially when dealing with the Union. Because historically, one of the main problems the Union had was being able to stretch supply lines deep into what was enemy territory. Um... So that's going to be a problem for us because we're going to have to just be constantly building supply and it's going to slow down how fast we can move armies into the south. Now, as with the past, uh, I will not start recruiting any patron units until we get at least two year units available to us. Uh, so we're going to start right away with military one. Um, no, actually, it's uh, the Militia Act is where we get these. So um, we'll start with... Yeah, we'll start with Military 1, and then we'll start working on these Militia Acts. Uh, I don't think we can do the first one until the war actually starts. And then we'll eventually get down to the 24-month troops, and that's when we'll start uh, recruiting those patron units. If you want to have your own unit in the game, those are available to patrons starting at the captain level, which is $10 a month uh, on up. It's just a way of providing a perk uh, for folks who want to support the channel and we are going to be doing daily content this will be an every other day series uh, and on the off days we'll be doing other stuff uh, i'm gonna definitely continue uh, with the uh, ultimate general or ultimate, ultimate admiral uh, age of sales series and we're also going to sprinkle in some more hearts of iron four down the road so those will be coming all right, financially, uh, we don't need to have all the money into politics just yet because we don't need those additional policies until we've used all the policies that we already have available to us. Um, so right, you know, once we get those policies maxed out, only then will we start investing in politics to get additional policies. So we're actually not spending any money on any subsidies right now. We're gonna kind of stockpile that money as best we can. Uh, in the meantime, how long do we have on that first policy? 33 days. So there's not a lot that's going to go on early on. It's only February 23rd. Lincoln will become president in March. Back then, 
uh, the president was inaugurated in March rather than January 20th like it is today. January 20th only uh, became the date for inaugurations in the 20th century. Jefferson Davis is inaugurated as president of the Confederacy. You can see here, if you're new to the series or if you're new to the history of the Civil War, uh, that so far, Arkansas, Tennessee, North Carolina, Virginia are not in the Confederacy. They only joined the Confederacy after the war actually began, after uh, Fort Sumter took place and um, Lincoln called for 75,000 volunteers. Loyalties in Missouri, torn. Every time one of those pops up, I do, you know what, I'm going to change that. Um, I have it set to where um, every time the newspaper pops up, um, and then we close it it remains pause so this will change that I can I can still hit P to pause and unpause if I want to Kentucky vows to remain neutral okay it's March 4th Lincoln has become president yeah we did get a notification as well that the Fort Sumter uh, situation deteriorates. Virginia's loyalty is questioned. So we're just seeing, it's, it's very immersive. It gives you all of those kind of things to show you how the situation was deteriorating and how events were unfolding. The CSA army has been established. Uh, so far, you know, you can see we've only got 2,600 men in the field. They've got 2,500. We've got that huge advantage in Navy tonnage. Honestly, that's something I can be working on now. Um, would be to start working on some new naval ships. Uh, and I should note too that we now have the ability to promote commanders. Uh, and there's some factors that go into that that we'll talk about as we go a little further into things. Uh, I want to look at our fleets for a second though. We've got all of these ships that are in harbor, which means they're not actually attached to any of the existing fleets. Um, what I want to do right now though is I want to build some new uh, new ships. Do we have the ability to build ironclads? We do have the ability to build timberclad gunboats, which are nice, uh, but not ironclads, not yet. Okay, so there's military one policy. Uh, let's go ahead and look at our policies now because we do have Militia Act available. It's only going to take 13 days. Um, I do believe that'll trigger the war. Um, so it's possible that we could wait uh, to choose that in order to stave off the war if we wanted to have some other things in place before the war begins. Uh, for example, legal blockade, which will infuriate European leaders, uh, but it'll give me the ability to uh, subsidize the uh, trade war a little bit more, things like that. Um, or we could dive right into it. I'm thinking I might wait a little bit. So, for example, maybe pass the Regulars Act. That'll give me six small regular units with good training and experience added to my army. Uh, Diplomacy 1 allows us to import Enfield and Lawrence rifles, which might be nice to have before the war starts. Um, I think we're going to go ahead and do Diplomacy 1, assuming that allows me to stave off the start of the war a little while. I'm not sure if it will, because you know, I don't know if, if it's pre-kind of hardwired uh, for... Fort Sumter to happen when it historically did in the middle of April. So I guess we'll find out. All right. So it does seem like it's happening anyway. Um, Beauregard issues the ultimatum, which is going to result in the firing on Fort Sumter. So I guess, yeah, Fort Sumter surrendered. I guess that happens regardless of what we want. So Lincoln calls for volunteers. Uh, it looks like that means now that we're going to see the secession of those middle states. There we go. Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, Arkansas have seceded. So unfortunately, uh, that kind of throws us off a little bit. Oh, we actually, we get Militia Act 1 automatically. So that's actually really cool because that saved us from having to do that. So as soon as Diplomacy 1 finishes, we'll do Militia Act 2, Militia Act 3. It's going to take a little while. But as soon as uh, I get at least Militia Act 2, I can start recruiting some units. But I think we're going to start seeing Confederate units showing up right away. We do get some initial armies to start. You can see we've got 19,000 men. I'm thinking now we ought to be able to see our fleet start getting readiness. Um, and we get a few new fleets too. So my home squadron, the readiness was stuck. 
because uh, I was trying to move them down toward where Fort Sumter is, but it wouldn't let me do that. Uh, Atlantic Blockading Squadron, I want a little bit more than uh, what we currently have in there. Uh, so let's go ahead and throw some more ships into that. The USS Constitution and her 50 guns. We're going to throw that one in there to the Atlantic Blockading Squadron. A lot of these ships, you can see they're not nearly ready. What else can we throw in there? we got a couple of 74-gun ships that are just... It's pretty fantastic. Uh, the Atlantic Blockading, Blockading Squadron, as soon as we get our readiness up, we'll go ahead and stand, send them south. Uh, blockades have an effect on the imp the supplies that come in uh, and get to the armies, which is huge if I can kind of remove the ability for him to supply his armies. It's going to make my job easier in the field. And the, the better equipped those blockading squadrons are and the better position they are, the more effective they become. And we'll see that effectiveness once we get some of them into position. All right, I noticed that he's sending his James River Squadron, which is pretty weak, actually, out to sea. So we're going to go ahead and send our home squadron, which has 11 ships with 119 guns, a total firepower of 92, down here to face off against them. That's going to take them a little while to get there. But there's really not a lot else going on in the meantime. Oh, his, he is starting to field an army, though. <laughs> so that concerns me a little bit. Army of Northeastern Virginia, which is initially what Irvin McDowell's army was called. Uh, you can see here some of the key figures that will play a huge part later in the war. We've got William Tecumseh Sherman, uh, Ambrose Burnside, uh, folks like that who uh, eventually rise to high command. R Romain B. Ayers, I think, was a, a division commander. Israel Richardson was a division commander. He was killed during the Antietam campaign. Um, even guys like Erasmus Keyes uh, will play a big part in the war later on. One thing I do want to start doing right away is I want to look at some of these garrisons, especially the garrisons in the south, and do what I can uh, to recruit some units for those. I don't have a lot of available units at the moment, but what I do have, I'm at least going to get some going there. I'll get some small infantry brigades, 1,500 men, that sort of thing, uh, places like Fort Pickens. I don't even know where some of these forts are. Uh, so let's take a look and see which fort specifically we want to try and garrison a little bit. Uh, fort Pickens, I know, is uh, in modern-day Pensacola. Um, there's not a lot. We've got these forts down here I'm not too worried about. Uh, obviously, we lost Fort Sumter. We do have Fort Monroe up here. I don't, I don't know that these forts... Interesting, these forts are not even showing up anymore. Uh, Fort Monroe, we definitely need to garrison. But beyond that, I don't think I need to worry about it too much. Uh, Fort Washington, yeah. I might build a few more forts around Washington as well. Because we have the uh, Confederacy set to the highest difficulty, uh, that means he's going to be super aggressive. And uh, he's already moving his 700 men uh, against me in the north. Uh, glorious victory in the Atlantic. We sank both those enemy ships. Well, actually, that was the North Carolina squadron. I don't know how many ships he had in that squadron. Uh, we were actually trying to face off against the James River squadron, uh, but that works too. We're also um, working on building up the garrison in Fort Monroe a little bit, but I definitely want to have this home squadron here to start blockading his supplies flowing into Richmond. And I also uh, beefed up the garrison for Fort Washington. We're going to send Patterson's Department of the Pennsylvania uh, as soon as they're ready and able to go uh, to counter this movement that I saw happening with the Army of the North Northwest. He was showing up as here, but when you see this question mark like that, that means you really don't know for sure where he is. That's your last reported position. But I am going to just move west just to kind of keep an eye on things a little bit. Okay. Atlantic Blockading Squadron, we're going to give them orders to blockade. And then we're going to send them down, I'm thinking, right around Charleston for now, that area. Nine ships, 100 guns, 79 firepower. Once the other ships are ready, that'll get better. We have completed our Diplomacy 1 which means we can import Enfield and Lawrence rifles now. We're working on Militia Act 2. That's going to take another 22 days to get to 12-month troops. 
I do need to keep an eye out on what the Confederacy is doing. And right now they've got 37,000 men, which means we're going to have to go ahead and start recruiting some of these three-month troops, which historically that's what the Union did. Uh, you'll see, like, for example, when researching a unit, you know, the 20th Ohio, which is a unit some of my ancestors were involved in. Um, there was a three-month unit called the 20th Ohio. That one served for three months in the summer of 1861. Uh, and then their enlistment was over. Uh, so they created a new unit in the fall of 1861 that was a three-year unit once they realized the war wasn't going to be over quickly. So let's go ahead and recruit a couple of additional units here. Looks like Joe Hooker, uh, Edwin Sumner are going to get in command of some of those. Uh, Don Carlos Buell is going to get a battery. Uh, we do have some decent weapons here, but these are three-month units. I want to save the good weapons uh, for our real kind of long-term army units that we're going to need very, very soon. I'm going to go ahead and uh, let's take a look real quick. Right now we have the Department of Pennsylvania, the Department of the Ohio under McClellan. Uh, let's go ahead and create a couple of divisions there. And we'll worry about who's in these divisions and all that sort of thing later on. I just at least want to have some units to hold off against what the Confederates do while we wait for more to come. The Gulf Blockading Squadron only has three ships in it, so we obviously need to do something about that. Let's drop some new units that we already have into that with some uh, pretty significant firepower, although it's going to take a while for them to actually become a part of that. Um, all right, so we're going to give them blockade orders, and we're going to send them over. Oh, the Confederacy is investing heavily in industry. They just did industry two already. Um, all right, this one doesn't have readiness yet. Once they do have readiness, we'll send them over to blockade at New Orleans. New Orleans is by far the largest city in the Confederacy. I think it's seven times larger than the next largest city in the Confederacy. That's how much bigger it was than everywhere else. And it was occupied by the Union pretty early in the war. Okay, we fought a battle with our Atlantic blockading squadron in Pamlico Sound. We sank one ship. We captured another. Uh, so some nice things happening with the Navy right now, even though there's not a whole lot else going on. You can see here two Confederate ships under Commodore Tottenall, uh, and we sank one, captured the other one. So I wonder now, does that mean that that ship becomes uh, available for us? I don't know how that works. I've never, I don't remember capturing ships before in the game. I'm sure that's a thing. But I don't see it in here. Oh, okay. Here it is. It's in the Atlantic Blockading Squadron. It's the CSS uh, Okini. Uh, it's a fourth rate steamer. We're going to drop that into our harbor for now until we decide what we want to do with it. Oh, hello. All right, time out, because this is new. This is a screen I have not seen before, and this is awesome, especially for all you naval buffs out there. We actually get to see what's happening in a major naval combat situation. So we've got French Forrest, who's the commander on the uh, Confederate side. We can see the James River Squadron uh, is here. We've also got the North Carolina squ Squadron. We can see the condition of each of those ships. Uh, we can see ours as well. We can see the ammunition situation, whether or not they're in range. Uh, and we can see exactly what's happening. Penetration, hit, and what happens with those. And any perk effects that may be happening. This is really, really cool. That's new to the game, and I love it. So let's go ahead and watch this unfold a little bit. Obviously, there's a lot here. Um, Navy firepower. Uh, it's 76 to 4, so it's obviously really one-sided, and it's only a matter of time. We've got 9 ships active to his 6, 98 guns to his 11. The Battle of the Atlantic. I love it. The USS Constitution is the one that's being fired on by his entire fleet right now. Old Ironsides, baby. Looks like she's the only one in range. No, the Constitution and the Congress are both in range at the moment. 
Constitution hasn't been firing, though. I'd like to see us start firing back a little bit. It's close distance. The combat width. Number of ships that are able to engage side by side. Our firepower is going down. Oh, it's because we're getting low on ammo. Darn it. Well, that's not ideal. Our firepower is down to just 15 now. Jeez. So this might not go as well as we thought it would. Let's go ahead and speed things up a little bit. Now our firepower is down to just 7, but his is at 1. Disaster! What? It has to be because of the supply situation. With us being thoroughly outgunned and outmaneuvered by a superior enemy. No, we weren't. We had a massive ship there. Our a squadron there. Well, that's a little disappointing. So it says we have nine ships and nine are disabled. That's strange. All of those ships, and that's what we came out of here with. Huh. Okay. Maybe we just weren't ready yet. Maybe we just need to give them time to get those ships in a place where they're able to do what they need to do. Okay, we've got our 12-month contracts. Uh, so let's go ahead now, back to our policies, and immediately start working on Militia Act 3. It's going to take a month. Once that is complete, we start recruiting our patron units, and we'll start uh, in order. Uh, with our division requests if possible and then uh, in order with our brigade requests after that uh, at the moment the confederates still have a bit of an advantage in numbers uh, but again a lot of these are militia units that uh, are three month units that only have a month remaining on their contracts so we'll be starting to replace those with the other ones uh, i want to look at the fleets real quick here atlantic blockading squadron is the one that just fled in dishonor. Uh, nine ships disabled, 100 guns, 78 firepower. I want to wait until all of those ships are ready to go. I don't know why they're so um, they're in such bad shape, but we're going to obviously need to get them back down there as soon as we possibly can. All right, the Confederacy has got their two-year contracts already. Uh, we are still, how far away are we on those? We're still 24 days away from getting those. So we're going to have to keep an eye on things. Right now, we're pretty close to even. And I would rather not spend the money and the manpower uh, to recruit 12-month units when I can easily get the uh, two-year ones. So I'm going to hold off on those as much as I possibly can. you got to remember, once the Battle of Bull Run takes place, which is in... Uh, that happens July 21st of 1861. For the most part, there's not really any major movement by the armies until the spring of 62. Um, it's the only real major battle that's fought in the East. The first major battle you have in the West, and I'm talking major battle, uh, is when you, when you have Grant moving on uh, Fort Donelson in February of 1862. Okay, so we see a blockade here. It says blockades one, uh, Cairo blockade efficiency 14%. Does the Confederacy have a blockade happening in Cairo, Illinois? Um, or is that us? Blocked by 14%. So uh, that obviously is the Confederacy that's doing that. So I, that reminds me, I do need to get a fleet going. A uh, brown water fleet, as they call it. Um, so let's go ahead and create a new fleet. We're going to create that, I think. Um, Cairo is only a port level one. We've got Chicago Harbor port level two. That doesn't really help me. Um, I need one somewhere on the river. But it doesn't look like I have one. All right, so Cairo it is. I don't know what we can build in Cairo. As long as I can get some gunboats, that's the main thing. Uh, these have 12 guns, these timber-clad gunboats. Uh, so we're going to go ahead. The USS General Grant. That's an interesting name. Um, since we don't have a General Grant yet. 
Um, but I like it. We'll go with it. Uh, what else can we transfer into that squadron? Uh, we're going to rename this too. This is going to be the... Uh, for, just for lack of a better name for now, we're not Cario. Um, the Cairo squadron. It is pronounced Cairo. Uh, just so we know where it's based. It makes it a little easier for me to keep track of it that way. Um, let's go ahead and drag a couple of these smaller gunboat ships into that. We'll take the Oconee and put that in there. We're going to have to rename it, though. Can't keep it with a CSS name. Okay, so uh, we'll keep the we'll keep the name. I don't remember if that's how it was spelled or not. Eh, we'll just come up with something else. Uh, USS Meade. I like General Meade, even though he's not a general yet in our timeline. But we'll go with it. All right. In the meantime, uh, while we're waiting to be able to recruit those two-year troops, we are going to go ahead and move the Department of the Pennsylvania down here and grab Harper's Ferry, that armory. Uh, it's a supply depot that we could then start to upgrade. It also hopefully will prevent him. Oh, hey, hello. Uh, his army of the Shenandoah does not like that. And they've got 11,000 men. So maybe that's not the way to go just yet. As soon as I started making that move, you could see that he started moving too. All right, he's only got 5,000 men in his Army of the Potomac, and yes, that is what the 1st Confederate Army was called. Kind of a backwards thing. You got the Union Army of Northeastern Virginia and the Confederate Army of the Potomac, but that is what they were. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and engage them. I want to push them at least out of Alexandria, which the Union did occupy uh, in the spring of 1861. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and get our first taste of combat before we start recruiting those uh, long-term units. All right, well, as expected, we're going to be on the Bull Run battlefield. Now, I've got a 3-to-1 advantage in manpower, but that does not feel make me feel tremendously confident because we are relying on our subordinate commanders. So in this case, we've got three divisions under Tyler, Hunter, and Runyon. They're going to be responsible uh, for what we do. So we do have objectives that we have to grab here. The Confederacy is probably going to be somewhere in this area. Uh, so what I'm going to do for now is I'm going to give an AI stance uh, of attack with Daniel Tyler. Actually, we're going to move the whole force up here first. We're going to give Hunter a screen order and Runyon an attack order. I'm going to send Runyon up toward the stone bridge. We're going to send Tyler down toward Lewis's Ford. And then we're going to send Runyon with his screen order. Uh, I don't know, Poplar Ford, I guess. Okay, we've got our first sight of the enemy who's dug in in fortifications right here. Our divisions are moving slowly. Tyler's taking forever to get moving over there. Runyon's right here at the crossing. I'm going to go ahead and give him orders to cross since it appears he's going to be able to do that without too much opposition. David Hunter, I definitely don't want attacking head on. Let's go ahead and give him screen orders to go ahead and cross up here. This is a really dangerous spot just because of the terrain. It's pretty brutal here. But I want to come at these guys from the side, definitely not directly on. I don't know if he'll attack automatically. 
I also really don't know why Burnside's going that way, but that's going to be a disaster. Hey, Hunter, no, don't send Burnside over there. Wow. But, hey, I'm not issuing individual brigade orders, so that's Hunter's responsibility. He does have a screen order, which means he shouldn't engage directly. He should fall back if that happens. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and send the New Jersey militia uh, under Runyon uh, to go ahead and start thinking about engaging. Sounds like Confederate artillery has begun to fire on Burnside. Looks like this U.S. cavalry is coming over here to join him. I think Burnside's kind of stuck there. So it looks like Hunter's redirecting his entire division over to here. So he's countermanded my order to go to Sudley Church, and he's brought his whole division back over here to where Burnside is. That's fine. I don't have a problem with that order. I'm not going to throw a fit about that. Runyon's getting into position. I'll be interested to see if he goes ahead and launches his attack. Because he does have an AI stance uh, order to attack. But I don't know exactly. I haven't done a lot with these stances, so I don't know exactly what to expect if I need to tell him specifically to attack that Confederate line. Or if he'll do it once he gets into position. Looks like Burnside sent some skirmishers forward. I don't know what that accomplishes, really. All right, I'm going to go ahead and switch David Hunter to a defend order over there. Tyler, let's go ahead and move him over to here. I don't like where McDowell is. It makes it difficult to issue orders to the whole army, so I'm going to move him a little more central to the army. All right, we're going to tell him to go ahead and attack the right flank of the Confederates. And for some reason, that means he's going to send his entire division into one spot. Hopefully that will change. See what the situation looks like as far as casualties go so far. 16 for us, 0 for him. Hey, uh, you want to maybe, I don't know, move your cannons in a position where they can actually fight back? I'm really not sure what Runyon's doing. He's got an AI stance attack order. I'm thinking maybe we need to switch to an assault order. I don't know. It's going to take me a little bit of time to learn how to manage these things. Now we'll stick to attack. I might just need to order uh, to issue a new order for him to move up a little further as a division. Right, let's tell Hunter to go ahead and move up a little closer, too. It's just going to, everything's going to just take longer because I have to deal with division commanders. And it's going to get very frustrating at times. And that's, it's going to be much more important for me to have competent commanders in those positions because I'm not going to be uh, constantly undermining them and micromanaging their brigades for them. Okay, there it is. Now, now that he was close enough, he's going to go ahead and launch his actual attack. And we're going to go ahead and tell, I think we'll go ahead and tell Hunter to attack too. Just to put the pressure on him a little bit more. 
So we've got Hooker's Brigade coming in. They've got mixed muskets. I'm not giving any good weapons to these early, these three month units. I'll save those for the good units that I'll start recruiting after this battle. Burnside skirmishers are up there taking the brunt of things right now. We have started inflicting some casualties though. Come on, Hooker. Pour it into him. I don't know why New Jersey militia is holding back some of their forces. And it looks like Tyler's brigades are pretty winded. Come on, you got Sumner with 3,000 men sitting there. Why aren't you using them? Looks like he is sending some new orders. Oh, that's a, that's actually probably the courier coming with the attack uh, orders for the division over here, Hunter's division. All right, looks like he's moving his battery, Buell's battery, into position with these six pounders. Yep, here comes Hunter. He's going to launch his attack. Looks like the Confederates are going to start falling back now. Falling back. They, they know they're just overwhelmed numerically. I still don't understand why he's holding back his largest brigade. speed things up a little bit. The cab just went right into the middle of things. They're going to dismount and engage. Who was wounded? The commander of the cavalry was wounded. Now you can see this is cool because you can see the Confederates are falling back, Hampton's Legion, but they're fighting a kind of a tactical withdrawal. They're, they're firing as they fall back. I like seeing that. Baker's Militia Brigade lost 89 men. We are starting to see this turn into a victory, though. But two to one casualties in his favor. But that's to be expected. We're, we're the attackers. All right, Tyler's division's still getting into position. And they're gonna be exhausted. But I tell you what, these guys are pushing. I like to see that. I like seeing our, our generals be a little bit aggressive here. And they're pushing, pushing, pushing. Let's go ahead and give Tyler more, more orders. I don't think it's gonna matter a whole lot. late in the day. I don't know how much more fighting we're going to see today. Morale's pretty low on both sides, but we have routed some of his men, but we're taking casualties to do it, that's for sure.
But this is what you want to see. You don't want to see us with a massive advantage in casualty numbers because we're the attackers. We should be suffering more casualties than him. Percentage-wise, it's pretty even. I really wish he'd send Porter over here because we could get a lot more firepower on them. But that is not my job to tell the division commander what to do. And Sumner's been in reserve this whole time. Ooh, three to one casualties now. Ooh, it's been brutal. You can see why it's going to be important that I have the numbers because uh, until we get some better weapons. Come on, get Sumner in the action. Man. All of this fighting and Yule's lost 16 men. Dang, still three to one. All right, you know what? Runyon, assault orders. Hunter, assault orders. The morale's not looking good for these guys right now. And Tyler's just now getting his men in position. Let's move McDowell up. Once again, he's too far from the action. Here comes the assault. Sumner's going to get in on the action now, finally. Now the casualty figures are, are starting to creep up for the Confederates. Now that we sent, now that uh, he finally sent Sumner's brigade in there, it looks like he's gonna he's gonna send him forward. That actually even the casualties out a lot. Here goes Sumner taking that assault order. Tell you what I like right here. See how it's curved? He curved his um, his stance because I, I like that because he's facing these guys over here rather than just making a straight line. All right, that's a victory, a costly victory, but a victory. Uh, that assault there at the end, finally sending Sumner's men into the attack, smashed Jones's line, and we're going to end up seeing pretty even casualties on each side. So that gives you a little taste of what to expect with how things are going to be done. And, and once we start getting big armies, we're going to be dealing with massive divisions that we'll have to manage. But that's how we're going to do things, is at the division level. I won't be micromanaging the brigades. I think it'll make for a much more realistic experience and a much more challenging experience. Okay, so you can see the numbers. 1256 for me, 1100 losses for him. Uh, it's a much higher percentage of his force, of course. But that's a minor victory. And I think we'll go ahead and wrap up right there. Uh, at the start of the next episode, we will start to get those uh, patron units recruited. This is going to be a long series. Uh, it's going to take a long way to go, and it'll be every other day. I have no more travel planned, at least till the end of January. So I will be around and able to uh, commit to making more regular contents. So I hope you enjoy. Let me know your thoughts. Use the comment section below. And you, if you'd like to see your own unit in the game, you can sign up as a patron using the link in the description. And we'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.